Hi, I'm Ken Howard, and welcome to the Gay Therapy LA podcast. Today, I'd like to talk about gay men and coping with cheating. In previous episodes, uh, episode 15, I think it was, I discussed the reasons for cheating in a gay men's relationship and some tips on how to prevent this to the extent that anyone can. Many other authors, figures, you know, including my gay male therapist colleagues, have written about infidelity and you know, how gay couples might heal from a relationship crisis when a partner breaks an agreed-upon monogamy agreement or relationship contract. But here, I wanted to share some thoughts that permeate my experience in working with gay men on relationship issues with individuals or couples over my long, as you know, 31 years in 2023 career as a gay men specialist therapist in ASECT, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, certified sex therapist, and relationship coach for gay men all over the world. When I consider working with gay men in therapy or coaching over many years and with really, at this point, thousands of relationships, I believe there are some considerations about whatever you want to call it, cheating, infidelity, breaking a monogamy agreement, whatever, they don't get much consideration. So I'd like to offer my kind of perspective on it, and I hope it helps. So let's talk about an overview of cheating. So while countless, boy, articles and books and other podcasts will invoke the word infidelity, meaning lack of faith, to mean any romantic or emotional encounter or any form of sexually arousing experience with a partner outside of your spouse or partner, domestic partner, boyfriend, whatever, or people might use the word cheating as a slang for like when someone breaks the rules of a game or even the misandrist antiquated term, a philanderer or a ladies man or a womanizer, you know, in decades gone by in the case of straight men. For gay men, there aren't really equivalent terms to womanizer because, you know, our heteronormative world focuses so intensely on binary male-female relationships. Nearly all of the books, uh, especially by female therapists, on infidelity frame the situation as a discussion on how a self-indulgent, impulsive, hypersexual, immoral, cisgender, sex-addicted straight male commits a betrayal of their innocent, vulnerable, loyal wife and how to cope with that situation in heterosexual marriage. So, if a book or article discusses sex with outside partners regarding gay men, it's kind of an outlier. You know, they're rare. However, avaricious therapists who want to help people affected by these experiences might borrow from heterosexual relationship dynamics in religious-based marriage, as opposed to civil marriage, might sell services that treat sex addiction. You know, my feelings on that is malarkey or provide healing to victims traumatized by infidelity of any gender. You know, these things are problematic when they are put in such cops and robbers, perpetrator and victim, black and white terms. Cheating or infidelity should not be put in the same category as rape or sexual assault, although I've seen people, including therapists, who do this. And I take offense to that due to my work also with true rape and sexual assault survivors whose experience is trivialized if that gets compared to someone merely having sex outside of a relationship. There's no comparison, and yet you get plenty of people who say the betrayal is absolutely exactly the same. No, you talk to true sexual assault survivors and they'll explain why they're different. One of the challenges in the delivery of either psychotherapy services or coaching services worldwide is that it is relatively rare, even in urban areas, but certainly in rural areas, as well as non-Western countries, for the needs of gay men and gay male couples specifically to be addressed as such. Our needs and unique dynamics are often ignored, like we don't exist, like, and yet we exist everywhere, every place and throughout history. This is why my clients seek out a long-term gay men specialist therapist and coach like me, because they want the specific cultural competency that it takes to work with gay men and how they differ from straight relationships. I've got another episode on that and a blog article as well at gaytherapyla.com blog. 
So even though there can be overlap, you know, great authors like Esther Perel uh, in New York, who's Belgian, and to some degree, Doctors June, John and Julie Gottman, uh, PhDs, make efforts to be inclusive of gay and lesbian relationships, although they don't tend to validate or discuss triads or polycules or polyamory or gender diverse relationships. They tend to look over all of that. They tend to just kind of reapply their actually very helpful services for straight couples as an overlay to same-sex couples, which is not fully culturally competent and affirmative, because some things just don't translate that way with two men. So we have to start the discussion of the considerations of cheating, for lack of a simpler word, for gay male couples, knowing that we have to take mostly heteronormative ideas about it and adapt them for gay men's culture and experience. Even the word cheating is very values and judgmentally based, implying that one partner of the dyad is breaking the rules in an obnoxious and harmful, narcissistic, self-indulgent, hypersexual way, while the other partner is an innocent victim of their partner's betrayal. And it's not that simple. Cheating and affairs are the result of a complex dance of relationship emotional, physical, social, and sexual dynamics that are nuanced. And they just can't be dumbed down simply because we don't have the patience to understand them in depth, which I see so often with the women all good, men all bad attitude toward heterosexuality that somehow gets carried over into gay men's relationships. Like we just can't avoid that heteronormative boy-girl, boy-girl perspective. You know, like straight people who hear about a gay couple down the block and they say, oh, which one's the woman? You know, in this antiquated and offensive invalidation of true same-sex relationships. There is no woman. Everybody's a guy here. And that means the male psychology and social dynamics are compounded. Romantic and sexual issues, including cheating incidents, are dynamic and nuanced experiences for gay men. The sexual, emotional, relational, social, socioeconomic status or class, cultural, historical, ethnicity, racial, age, gender, and professional identity considerations all play a role in the situation. And it's all more of a process than an event. I think the discussion of cheating needs a more modern take, which it rarely gets. Esther Perel comes awfully close to cutting-edge understanding for today's world, you know, not like stuff that was written in the 70s. It's much more timely. I'm not her agent, by the way. Um, <laughs> but she has great stuff. You know, um, she has a perspective that isn't so antiquated from books from decades past. And her book called The State of Affairs is great but you do have to make a little bit of a leap to apply it to same-sex couples. Let's talk about history culturally about cheating. So the topic of cheating has very deep roots in anti-female sexism and misogyny. Its history involves heterosexual relationship dynamics where women are seen as chattel for men, like property. Not really people, but only made by God from Adam's rib for the enjoyment of man and the procreation of the species. Misogyny is so rampant in the United States in politics today, with the overturn of Roe v. Wade and forcing women to have all babies after pregnancy, yet providing no financial support afterward. And there's an extra layer of systemic political oppression against trans women having medical care, playing sports, having workplace protections, having legal protections from violent crime. John Lennon said, woman is the N-word of the world. And I think at a point, he probably said that close to 60 years ago. In many past years, pretty recently actually, it, cheating meant that the heterosexual marriage was irreparably undermined and would inevitably end. That's it, divorce, that's it, goodbye. Adultery, you know, has been the legal grounds, the legal terms for seeking a divorce. You know, before we had no fault divorce, you had to have a damn good reason. You know, cruelty, abandonment, adultery, irreconcilable differences, you had to hang it on something or a judge wouldn't grant it. Now it's no fault you can do it more, but but adultery was, boy, one of the big ones that a judge would grant a divorce over. 
cheating and the almost mandatory subsequent divorce was leaving a woman in society as a vulnerable divorcee at a time when women were seen as fully dependent on the provider male spouse for their economic survival. You know, for historical example, before 1935 in the introduction by Franklin, President Franklin Roosevelt of the Social Security Act, which was income for the elderly and disabled from the government, the United States had these widows' charities, you know, when women couldn't work because they held they were held out of, of many or most professional positions and couldn't possibly support themselves, especially in old age. I have a very smart older woman friend who was a Yale Law graduate in 1960, and she told me when she applied for jobs at law firms in Los Angeles when she moved here from New York, she was told to her face by the law firms, we don't hire women let alone Jewish women. And they could get away with saying that right to her face because there were no legal protections from discrimination until much later. She actually went to work for the California Attorney General's office and then opened her own law firm with her husband and became a multimillionaire. So there you go. Living well is the best revenge. <laughs> but it was fascinating to me that as recently as 1960, you know, not 1860, that women were directly barred from the opportunities for so many things that men could take for granted. Women were not seen as strong professionals, so they were seen as victims of cheating that threatened their economic existence. It was not just a sexual thing or a relationship thing. It was an economic thing. So for gay men coping with cheating, we need to have the courage to challenge what we've always been taught, actually quite fervently, about how relationships work and what cheating is, always in this heteronormative religious context that's been made into civic law. However, as grown gay men, we are under no obligation to capitulate to religious rules about relationships and sex unless we choose to, which gay men have the right to do. My podcast about reclaiming your spirituality and, and its sister blog article on gaytherapyla.com slash blog. I think it's just called uh, Search on Reclaiming Your Spirituality. It's talking about how, you know, gay men have been so abused by so many different religious traditions around the world, up to and including capital punishment or just discrimination, that, you know, it makes you feel like gay men have shut out of religion and spirituality. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of gay men who actually are religious. You know, they want nothing to do with the anti-gay churches, but that doesn't mean they don't want to be involved with their own synagogue or their own church or their own temple or, you know, different kinds of things. Gay men have as much right to practice their religion as anybody else does because it's an adulteration of world religions, really, when they're anti-gay because they get away from the benevolent, loving messages. So the long, so long, in fact, any alternative is mostly considered wrong, history of monogamy as the only legitimate and socially accepted form of relationship was opposed by the church, especially the Catholic church, as a way of imposing social and economic order to countries all over the world throughout history, you know, except in some cultures such as Asian or Middle Eastern countries where the men are allowed to have multiple wives. Remember the king and I, you know, gay man, I'm going to make a Broadway musical reference, you know, the king had this parade of all of his wives and concubines, because he was entitled as the king to just do that and have all these kids. Or you might hear in Middle Eastern countries about a man with multiple wives. Even the history of Mormonism has some of that. But mostly, you know, we're, we're fed this very, very dyadic male-female heterosexual model and we're taught that that's really the only legitimate way to live. So at that time, monogamy served as a stabilizing force in society and economics before we had more sophisticated civil law to do that. You know, as recently in the United States as the George W. Bush presidency, he pushed for and got congressional federal spending money to simply promote marriage promote marriage, which at that time was limited to heterosexual marriage, you know, because from the Republican point of view, more co-supportive households could share expenses and take care of each other. And then it's less burden on the government to spend taxpayer money on social services for vulnerable single people. Let their spouse take care of them. Everybody do the buddy system. 
So it's a little twisted, but they saw marriage as a cost-effective and stabilizing force in society, which could be one reason why generally anti-gay politicians tolerate same-sex marriage, because in kind of a cynical way, it's good for the economy. It's actually good for national security. It stabilizes society. They're not going to admit that, but it does, just in the way, as George W. Bush said, heterosexual marriage stabilizes society. So in the 21st century, we have a new social order, you know, in most Western countries, that is, and a new model of economy where men don't always just support helpless women in one nuclear family. You know, before it was assumed that with a man's domestic presence and income or absence in the case of alimony and divorce, that was the only way that women could survive because being barred from the same workplace opportunities that men had was because of widespread patriarchy. They could be obnoxious about that and they could get away with it for a while. You know, cheating became socially anathema on an economic level, but cheating was also an example of straight men's entitlement in the patriarchy. When straight men's sexuality is not only allowed to be indulged any way they see fit, but is actually pressured to be. And women's sexuality is to be invalidated and oppressed. Although, you know, where are the straight men getting their partners? That's always kind of the puzzle. Young boys are taught that they must have heterosex by their fathers. You know, they're growing up and becoming teenage boys, and they're a boy, you go get them. You know, while their mothers are very gracefully looking the other way. Joe Court, my colleague in Detroit, a great, great therapist and author, talks about this being the covert sexual abuse of boys to pressure them into heterosexuality, which, you know, for a gay boy is traumatic. It doesn't work that way. You know, and then young girls, of course, are taught that, oh, they must not, and they have to be coy, and good girls don't put out, and all that stuff. And there's always this contradiction that goes all the way back to this, you know, 1930s, 40s, 50s dynamic about sex and dating. One of the many reasons that women even today react to cheating by their husbands or boyfriends with a profound, aggressive, self-righteous anger is an expression of the almost limitless white-hot abandonment rage that has sometimes led to murder or manslaughter. How will they survive or at least keep the same standard of living if their husband devotes time and attention and sex and probably money on another woman or even a second family? You know, another musical reference. In Evita, Eva talks about how her father had a second family in Argentina and she was part of that and they were kept out of sight at his funeral. It's in the lyrics. So despite women's gains in social and economic independence, today's modern woman in heterosexual marriages have an economic anxiety as well as an emotional difficulty when discovering a man whom they assumed was monogamous in sex and love and support was devoting at least some of those resources to someone else. How dare he? And women also, in general, speaking really, really broadly, see sex and love as intertwined men, straight and gay, just kind of naturally are able to separate those two things. They can be joined, you know, love making that kind of thing, but men just have a capacity of saying, of, of being able to separate sex and love, which is one of the reasons why men, straight men and straight women sometimes have a lot of friction about this, because they don't see eye to eye. It's like that Mars-Venus thing. So it's not that straight women don't ever cheat as well for often, you know, the same or different reasons that straight men do, often due to just unmet needs. They do do that. But when most people think of cheating, they think heterosexuality and they think of men. And their perspective has to turn somersaults to wrap their heads around straight women cheating or gay men cheating. They're like, oh, they do that? Oh, okay. How does that work? If cheating has a history rooted in the misogynistic idea that women are weak and must always be protected by economic and domestic and sexual fidelity because they can't make it on their own as working people in a capitalist society, it's also rooted in the misandrist idea that men, straight or gay, are only all about sex and think with a small head and are incapable of having emotional needs and vulnerability or the capacity for interpersonal secure attachment 
or the idea that men are always perpetrators and women are always victims in cheating or discrimination or crime, abuse or greed or exploitation. Think of Giselle Maxwell, the accomplice to Jeffrey Epstein in the sexual abuse of young girls. For men gay and straight who are survivors from women perpetrators of interpersonal crimes, this is a devaluation and invalidation of their lived traumatic experience to say that these are the character gender stereotypes. People can be all kinds of diverse ways regardless of gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, national origin, all of that stuff. You find, you find heroes and you find scoundrels in every group. So in countless ways, heteronormative perspectives and practices throughout history, they just don't translate to gay men. If we try, there is always this dynamic of trying to put a square peg in a round hole. Gay men's perspective need their own legitimacy, even if they we are, as gay men, numerically in the minority among men, but we're not inferior in value. That's the thing about minorities. We're numerically, sure, there's more gay, more straight men than there are gay men. We're a minority. In the United States, there's more white people than there are black people. They're in the minority, but that doesn't mean they're inferior in value, and that's the social mistake that's made so much in homophobia and in racism, is this idea that minority numbers equals inferior value. That's kind of messed up. Gay men need validation for their own cultural values and relationship structures that are not just a carryover from the heterosexist models. So let's talk about coping with cheating. So in my long experience providing couples therapy for gay men, oftentimes the recovery from cheating is a reframing that I like to say a little more gentle than that Nye cheat word. It, it, it sounds too slang. I call it a breaking of a monogamy agreement in which both partners play a part in the relational dynamic. Cheating doesn't just happen in a vacuum, you know, for the offending partner, but it is a mutual result of relationship dysfunction. When I taught the couples therapy course for graduate MSW, Master of Social Work students at University of Southern California, we began the course with a discussion of what marriage, or as I say, equally legitimate cohabitation, involves in terms of covenants. Covenants are an important agreement or set of agreements. So marriage, or always including cohabitation, even if you know the partners don't even live together, but each considers that they are in a formal relationship structure, involves a series of covenants that the partners make with each other about what will or will not happen in the relationship. It's a discussion of expectations, default ideas, assumptions, even demands they make of each other. It's a negotiation of what the partners can count on without having to constantly reiterate it, almost taking some things for granted as a constant, such as your spouse will come home at night unless traveling for work or for family or being out in a consensual non-monogamous relationship style that's agreed upon. In relationships, we need to have a bedrock of positive assumptions. Not everything can be in flux all the time and have to question it and and uh, reconfirm it, as that would be a constant stress in our already demanding, quick-shifting modern lives. Cheating can be interpreted or inferred to be devastatingly emotionally hurtful because it often means a person feels that they are a victim of a grave devaluation from someone, from their partner or their spouse, whom we have to, we've come to welcome and expect and even demand emotionally support from more profoundly and more intimately than anyone else in our lives. There's no one closer, and there probably shouldn't be than our spouse or partner, not even our parents. I've worked with guys on that, about they're too loyal to their parents and not enough to their partner, by like being in the closet when mom comes to visit. Even to their children, or even to their pets, and some would say to, to their religion. You know, you have to put your partner first, straight, gay, lesbian, whatever. All relationships take work. You know, my episodes on commitment, communication, and compromise as the building blocks of healthy relationships. But there's a certain full faith and credit expectation from our partners that they're one of the good guys to help us feel better in our sometimes shitty world. You know, they're not something that we have to develop defenses to, like human antibodies mounting an immune response to a foreign virus pathogen. We're supposed to see our partners as sources of relaxation and fun and love, not sources of pain and hurt and fear. 
We're supposed to take our partner's ongoing love and support as something we can count on to always be there when so many things aren't like that. For some, not all, this means that our partners will not love or fuck anyone else besides us in a consensually, uh, keyword, polyamorous relationship or an open or consensually non-monogamous relationship. They might. In polyamory, you might love a second or third partner, although that's rare. I've seen it work. I work with guys in those polycule relationships and help them kind of navigate through them. They don't really have more problems than dyadic two-person relationships have. And certainly working with lots and lots of guys who have some form of consensual non-monogamy. But I also work with some guys who have pretty strictly monogamous relationships because that has meaning for them. We'll talk about that later. When a partner in what was believed to be a monogamous relationship discovers that things are not what they seem, that their partner has deviated from what was previously known and understood and agreed upon, you know, perhaps for a long time, it means that life is asking them to immediately reconceive their relationship from one where monogamy could be taken for granted, you know, as a fact, to, to one that is indeed not. Your world changes instantly from saying, oh, okay, this is what our relationship is, to, oh, oh, wait a minute, okay, it's not what I thought, what? And it's disorienting, and it's upsetting. You know, our world changes in a moment, kind of like how our world changed after 9-11 or after COVID. There's a lot of people, we're not the same after 9-11. We went from a world in the United States where we had safety, where our continental borders had never been attacked. Pearl Harbor in Hawaii was, but, but not the mainland. And by, by day after 9-11, we live in a world where we could be domestically attacked. Or after COVID, you know, a million Americans have died in COVID. That's more than twice than died in World War II. And yet we consider World War II a disaster of our lost soldiers. And yet people aren't really talking about yet that COVID killed twice as many people and then some and then half as much again. So this is a big ask when we discover cheating because it can trigger profound feelings of betrayal and emotional abandonment and just sadness of law, sadness and loss of something that we held dear which humans are awfully vulnerable to because abandonment is one of the bigger emotional challenges that babies and toddlers and even children and teenagers can face growing up. It can be a developmental trauma. And if we experience those kinds of things in our formative years, when we are adults and we discover cheating, our emotional and psychological fences come rushing back to the fore and send us a message of, oh God, not this again. You know, including if we experience the trauma of dishonesty and betrayal in a previous relationship or in our childhood when maybe a parent died or a parent left the home, any of those kind of abandonment experiences in the child because the child kind of says, oh no, what do I do now? And the emotional antibodies when you discover cheating get reactivated. You know, they might have been dormant, but the, 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 the defenses get reactivated. And we say, oh God, not this again. So cheating in gay men's relationships, I've surmised after hundreds of cases, is the result of many different or combined reasons. It's in a previous episode, an article on gay men's relationship, how can I prevent my partner from cheating? Common reasons for cheating and how to manage them. So I'll refer you to that. But in short, it's basically due to physical or sexual, emotional, developmental stages of the lifespan or aging, something to do with your own sense of self or self-worth, something to do with social status or even entitlement, Tiger Woods, or family of origin. You know, while that's a limited list, you know, it's still a long one. So to understand what to do in response, not just immediate jerk reaction to the discovery of cheating, we need to explore and understand the reasons behind it. Why, not just that it happened, why did it happen? Understanding the reasons doesn't condone the dishonest behavior. It just illustrates, like an x-ray, the relationship dynamics that created the circumstances for the events to occur so that we can be empowered to address them successfully. 
the immediate negative reaction to the discovery of a partner cheating emotionally or sexually or both is often strongly negative because it, it is a drastic demand from life, capital L, life, to reconceive your relationship from what was previously known and familiar and expected and agreed upon, at least tacitly. You know, beware of monogamy assumptions early in relationships without an explicit discussion of a monogamy agreement because it's not always the default relationship structure and understanding. You know, it doesn't have to be. That would be heteronormative and patriarchal and imply a certain, you know, religious conservative perspective as if that's the only legitimate perspective to have. But if you make an assumption after you've been dating somebody for a little while that, of course, they're being monogamous to you, he might think, of course, we're not monogamous. We haven't had that discussion yet. So one person might be holding themselves off from dating or having sex with others, and the other one isn't there yet. It needs to be talked about. It needs to be explicit. So cheating can involve many of those reasons, like I said, or it can be less dramatic, such as a sexual encounter that the result of some impulsive, spontaneous, kind of thoughtless, inattentive behavioral choice. You know, it's probably influenced by libido or desire. We've all heard that. Oh, I was just horny on my business trip. Or alcohol or, or drug induced. Oh, I drank so much I couldn't think straight. And, you know, it just happened. Or I was really horny on G. Or, you know, something like that. Or disorientation, being in a new place or situation. And the impulsiveness, the spontaneity, acting without thinking, really thinking this through, just happens. So, and it's lacking a self-awareness, you know. So while cheating can happen for many reasons, the big one is usually just sexual. You know, cheating happens because sexual needs or desires, in this case gay men's sexual needs, are not being met. That's that simple. Gay men's sexual needs and desires are not generally validated in society. And actually they're specifically invalidated. Even from the current oh-so-progressive pope that we have in Italy, has basically said, well, you can be gay, just don't act on it with actual sex. You know, that doesn't make sense. That's bullshit. Homophobes to this day often see being gay as something that you do, not something that you are. And if you choose to do it, you can merely choose not to do it. It's the same with the current rageful debate and or war on gender identity issues. Transphobes believe that there are no trans women. They're just men putting on a dress who will, oh, they'll come to their senses later after using the dress as a clever disguise for access to women's safe spaces like restrooms or locker rooms or sports teams, gyms or social clubs for the sole purpose of sexually assaulting women. You know, J.K. Rowling's influential perspective all over Twitter that she put in an unsuccessful novel about a man who wears dresses in order to get close to women to assault them. It's messed up. If you really know trans women like I do in my family and in my work and my friends, it doesn't work like that. But yet, look at some Instagram or some Facebook or Twitter comments about some of the trans laws in the American South, especially Midwest, and you see how ignorant people are. It's more than a dress, people. You know, and being gay is more than, you know, what you do with, you know, some orifice. So cheating can be simply a defense against boredom sometimes and existential life ennui, particularly at midlife where you just get bored with things. You get bored with your job, bored with your partner, bored with your family, and you, sh you shake things up by having an affair or having, you know, playtime, especially with a younger kind of idealized partner, you know, some twink. Or it can be the expression against a, a defense of feeling controlled by your partner, kind of a clandestine resistance to experiencing your partner as being too controlling or too bossy. Even domestic violence sometimes can lead to cheating because you're trying to get away from this negative influence. I've seen that. Or it can be an embarrassment about having a kink interest that you feel that you can't share with your partner due to fear of their rejection or shaming for finding your kink or your sexual interest weird. So you do it with somebody else who's also into it and you don't have to kind of come out as having a kink interest that your partner might not like and point to and laugh and say, what do you mean? That's ridiculous. You know, guys are, are afraid of that oftentimes if they have a kink. So 
it can also be an outward manifestation of some ambivalence you feel about being in your relationship. Oh, well, I could take it or leave it. And you're unconsciously perhaps rocking the boat or even setting yourself up to get caught by leaving a trail of breadcrumbs so that you can rip the lid off the relationship problems and force confronting them. It's kind of a passive aggressive approach, but I've seen it a lot in my career. It does work to kind of blow the lid off and get things talking. So cheating can reflect an emotional unmet need in the relationship, such as feeling lonely in your own home. Straight women often cheat because of this. They feel lonely in their own home and then some other guy pays attention to them. It can mean a guy who is asserting a need for privacy and individuality away from the demands of a partner and spouse or a boss or a job or a community role. Think of a movie star or a politician or a civic leader. Your colleagues, your children, your family, your pets or life stressors. It's just kind of me time to sneak off to the hotel or wherever with some partner that's kind of a, uh, you know, that song, I'll keep you my dirty little secret. It can be about the invisibility of older gay men in society, you know, when no one cruises you on the street anymore. I've been through that. It's not fun. It happened in about my early to mid 40s and it just doesn't happen anymore. And if you used to have that, at least some, when you're younger, it's kind of a loss. You know, it was kind of a goodie that you lose because it um, just doesn't happen as much anymore. That gay men's invisibility phenomenon. And sometimes cheating or the affair can be an exercise that you still got it. You know, your partner might say that, but yeah, you'd rather have it... Uh, you'd like to have a second vote on that because your partner, you know, it's like your mom liking your drawing from art class you know, in elementary school. Oh, that's beautiful, honey. Yeah, I can totally see that's the Mona Lisa. You know, whereas if an art critic looks at it and says, you know, Madame, your child is an art genius, okay, then it has a different meaning. So sometimes guys are just looking for validation, you know, because they're having feelings about their own aging. It's not about their partner. It's not about the person they're cheating with. It, it's about how they feel about getting older, a sense of mortality, a sense of loss, and having to cope with a new phase in life. It can be about insecurities, about a lack of appearance privilege, and be a way to validate the self when other forms of value, such as work or from a partner, are lacking. It can be a defense against feeling alone or lonely or ignored or devalued. It can be a reassertion of a man's independence and a defense against feeling emasculated or socially or relationally impotent. Cheating is an incident in the course of a whole relationship. You know, it's not the whole relationship. It's a, a day in the life. You know, it's a very special episode of the life. It's not necessarily a demand for a relationship breakup. You know, it, some people think, oh, cheat once, that's it, I'm out of here. Mm, not necessarily. You're under no obligation to do that unless you want to, which you probably would have anyway. You know, there's this social pressure to punish the philanderer severely for daring to affront their partner. You know, it's one of those areas that actually is kind of misandrous because it's treating men as these unthinking, unfeeling sexual monsters. You know, Hillary Clinton faced so much pressure to very publicly denounce and divorce Bill Clinton after his affair or affairs, rather than letting her make her own decisions on how to respond based on her personal and familial and social and certainly political implications of whether or not to choose to divorce him and her and her daughter. You know, when so many people were out for blood, you know, to punish this rich, white, straight, cisgender, privileged, powerful, narcissistic patriarch who couldn't keep his pants zipped in the presence of an avaricious intern. So lots of men of power, you know, have had mistresses or side pieces or that kind of thing. You know, Martin Luther King was actually known for that. Or, you know, I mentioned Tiger Woods, a rich, handsome sports star, you know, or uh, there's just been so many others. Tom Brady, you know, where women and uh, a good percentage of men, I think even some straight men would put out for Tom Brady because he's just such a sports hero, you know. Or, or others that are somehow seen as being heroes that uh, just have this 
so much sexual prestige that they kind of get away with infidelity. It's almost expected. So how to pick up the pieces and cope after you've discovered cheating in your relationship. For couples to cope with cheating and its aftermath, it's important to set aside very focused, attentive time for a candid discussion, either alone or in couples therapy or relationship coaching with a professional. The partners need to discuss how they subjectively view the experience, what their subjective first person experience was and what they're thinking and they're feeling, and discuss the impact of what the incident or incidents of cheating has on them and discuss what alternative behaviors in hindsight would have been a better choice that would have resulted in less drama and less blood, sweat, and tears. You know, why didn't you come to me, come to me when there's problems in the relationship? Don't just act it out by having an affair. What other ways could someone deal with the the reasons for cheating that are perhaps more relationally compassionate or mature or well thought out? So if you're bored, can you discuss that? If you're having problems with aging, can you discuss that? If you have a kink that you want to explore sexually, can you discuss that? If you're angry at your partner, can you discuss that? All If you're feeling stressed out by all these demands of these roles that you have in your work and in society, can you talk about that? An affair that's clandestine and hurtful is kind of the wrong tool for the job. It, it maybe it just needs some other kind of behavioral choice that is better all around for everybody. So for so many discoverers of cheating, they say it's not about the sex, it's about the dishonesty. And this makes sense, especially since men in general, and gay men in particular, have an easier time conceiving of the differences between sex and love. You can have sex without being in love, and you can be in love without having sex. So many of the gay male couples I work with have long, stable, domestically, emotionally, familially fulfilling relationships, but their sex life has either been non-existent from the beginning, or it's diminished, or it's stopped, you know, without necessarily a burning desire to rekindle it, especially if they're happy to outsource the experiences to others in a consensual non-monogamy agreement. Those actually work. A colleague of mine really challenged me on that. He said, that never works. That's just dress rehearsal for a divorce. And I get pretty hot about that because that's when I start to pull rank and say, look, dude, you know, let's let's look at the data. My own practice data. You know, I am in the very privileged position to have the intimate secrets of at this point in my life and career. Thousands and thousands of gay male relationships that go back the whole way. And I know for a fact all different kinds of relationships can work. Monogamy certainly can work. You know, that monogamy is not a pipe dream. I know plenty of people who are really truly monogamous, not just saying that. Some of them do say that, and they're not at all monogamous. And a lot of them are very consensual non monogamous, and they're fine. They might have lots of other challenges because there's illness and accident and crime and job layoff and all kinds of stuff. But, you know, their non monogamous relationship is not the problem. So, but the anger that comes from the realization that someone has been devalued by way of being lied to is a hard incident to overcome. It's insulting to be lied to. It feels invalidating. And so it brings a certain righteous indignation of, don't you know who I am? You know, in a way that's actually a legitimate expectation of your partner or spouse, not the obnoxious way that James Corden might say that to restaurant staff. You know, it's a sense that If you can't be honest with me, can you please tell me who in the world you can be honest with? You know, it's kind of pulling rank to say, look, I should be number one in your life. You know, the the, the most important relationship in your life really should be your partner or spouse, or in the case of a polycule, your partners in, in the polycule. So cheating, or rather the dishonesty around it, I always find to be an issue actually of anxiety management. People lie when they're too scared or uncomfortable to tell the truth, or they fear life-changing catastrophic events if they do tell the truth. It's like a little kid who breaks something in the house and mommy says, who broke my vase? The kid's not gonna say, gee, mom, that was me. I was playing with my ball in the house even when you said not to and I broke the vase. I'm sorry, you can take the cost of a new vase out of my allowance, how's that? You know, no kid's ever going to say that. They're going to say, I don't know. 
because to cop to it would feel shameful and embarrassing and just too vulnerable in fearing mama or papa's reaction. It's the same with adults. They can't unring that bell if the cat's out of the bag on something. Lying is a defense against the shame of telling a truth. And it can also be a defense against a mature, of accept, a mature acceptance of responsibility for one's actions. You know, it can be when someone commits a crime that they know is a crime, and yet they want to cover it up to avoid taking legal responsibility. Donald Trump comes to mind. I, I always work with clients on the difference between shame and responsibility. Shame, yeah, there's no place for shame. Shame is negative and just destructive, whereas taking responsibility now is empowered and compassionate and just. You know, we see this so vividly in Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, the 12-step program, when members do the ninth step of the 12-step to identify those they have harmed by their actions and attempt to make amends about them. You know, that is sober thinking. It's, it's maturity, it's compassion, and empowerment to lead a better life than when you were in the throes of chaos due to drug or alcohol problems. You know, it can be spiritual, you know, getting right with God, as they would say, or it can be secular. You know, it can be wanting to live by positive secular humanist standards for interpersonal behavior. So if you find yourself doing something that you don't want to do, take responsibility for it. I had a guy, a very impressive, respectable Hollywood executive, come to my practice. And just like I always do, I say, how can I help you? And he looked right at me and he said, I want to stop being a dick. <laughs> and I, I laughed at first, I got to admit. And, but he explained, you know, he said, I know that I'm mean to my staff and to the people around me. And I come off as a know-it-all and I alienate people. And I want, at middle age, to learn how not to do that, to change my behavior. I had another guy who was starting his recovery in AA. And not only did he want to manage triggers for relapse on uh, a drug, but he also said, I'm funny and I'm catty and I can cut somebody down very easily and I want to stop doing that. I don't want to be known as the guy who has the funny insult cutting down people. I've had enough of that. It's funny. I make people laugh, but it's at someone else's expense. And at this stage of my life, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, so it's a behavioral adopting of responsibility. You know, you're not always beholden to previous behavior in so many different ways. If you take responsibility for changing it and you get support, keyword, through therapy or coaching for sustained behavioral change, eh, that's an improvement in your quality of life. And that could be about cheating. That could be about gambling. That could be about overeating. That could be about uh, too much drinking or drugging. It could be uh, just of any kind of negative trait that you want to try and reduce in your life in favor of something that you hold more valuable. So in relationships, I say there are some constants you know, I always say the older I get, the stronger my opinions get in my work because the sheer volume of experience in working with gay male clients, you know, individuals and couples, I see them making the same mistakes over and over. And more optimistically, I also see the kinds of remedies and actions that one can take that will reliably make your life better if only one chooses to do them. You know, don't you love it when things actually work? You know, so everybody's different that I work with, these wonderful, unique people, human beings, entities, but they often make very remarkably similar mistakes that upset them. And a lot of times the same strategies for solution uh, strategies do make their life better. So let's talk about the ways to talk yourselves into healing after a cheating incident, this rupture and repair. A lot of therapists talk about rupture and repair. So there are countless things, but one that always feeds the health of a relationship is for the partners to be willing to suck it up and be willing to have the difficult conversations. I've got an episode on that and a blog article. Be willing to have the difficult conversations. Don't avoid the tough stuff. 
You know, not because they're masochistic and want to enjoy feeling embarrassed or angry or hurt, but because they want the peace of mind that lies on the other side of a heartfelt, honest, compassionate, mature discussion of how to navigate a relationship challenge or crisis. You know, you might not like a lot of things that you go through. You might not like, oh, the treadmill again. Uh. But, you know, if on the other side of doing your cardiovascular exercise, you have you know, better health and lower cholesterol and all that stuff, then maybe it's worth doing. You know, you don't necessarily want what you're going through, but you want what's on the other side of it. You know, you might not want to get up and go to work every morning, but you want the paycheck that's on the other side of that. So honesty needs to be held dear as a value in a relationship, even when it's not comfortable. You know, grow up. Not everything worthwhile is comfortable or quick or easy. Whether it's diets or workouts, paying your bills, doing some kind of administrative drudgery grunt work, enduring various bodily discomforts, like having a colonoscopy or something, and also having frank but necessary conversations that address problems verbally rather than merely acting them out in some kind of clandestine, at least temporarily, behavior like cheating or affairs. You have to be able to tell your partner you have an ambivalence about sex with them. You have to tell your partner that some of your behaviors make you not want to be with them, or some of their behaviors, I mean. You have to be able to talk about the needs that you have, even if you yourself label them as weird. You know, such as telling your partner you have a sexual fantasy or fetish that you want to experience, maybe even on a regular basis. You have to tell them that while you love them, there are things that you don't like about them and that you would like to invite them to consider modifying behaviorally. I've had very recent clients who are working on the exact issue. They're asking their partner to be a little less of a certain kind of interpersonal social trait, particularly in public. You have to tell them how they make you unhappy with certain behaviors or a certain lack of behaviors. You talk them out, not act them out. And that empowers the both of you to find compassionate, mature solutions, not impulsive ones like the tail wagging the dog. Stuff doesn't just happen. You make something happen or not happen in your life. It's not the lazy river ride at the water park. Now, some things happen. You know, you don't make a car plow into you because they ran a red light at an intersection. I don't mean that. You know, you're not responsible for that. But as Jack Canfield says, and this fantastic book I love about self-empowerment, The Success Principles, event plus response equals outcome. Some events you can't help when they happen to you. You know, tornado hits your town. But your response to it is what affects the ultimate outcome. You know, you have a part in all of that. Event plus response equals outcome. Boy, is that useful. All people, certainly straight people, but gay men as well, are pressured to live a monogamous relationship structure as the right way to live, even if that is informed by religious, conservative, patriarchal, misogynistic, misandrist, or classist values at time. Healing from the pain of betrayal, anger, hurt, confusion, and disorientation means agreeing to implement a new normal of understanding of how to conduct your relationship. Talking about it is sometimes what's called the gift in dirty paper. You know, monogamy can be a choice that partners make because sexual exclusivity is infused with meaning that having sex only with each other keeps it special, unique, or sacrosanct and private and precious. You don't have to do it, just like you don't have to keep kosher or eat vegan or boycott Chick-fil-A, but you do it because in your value system, which can be emotional, relational, social, political, economic, spiritual, that act has meaning for you that gives meaning and value that other choices and behavior wouldn't. But partners need to discuss where their values are. They might debate the pros and cons of monogamy and the risks and rewards of non-monogamy and its many, many iterations. 
I help gay male couples often on what their relationship structure and ground rules are going to look like for them, even if they wouldn't work for any other couple, even if it's not transferable. So dealing with all this situation, you know, can be a sudden and unpleasant opportunity to discuss the things that probably should have been discussed long ago. It's an opportunity to discuss and apply critical thinking to how you as partners want to conceive and arrange how you live. It's an important opportunity to cultivate a new relationship agreement based on discussions of your joint thoughts and feelings and the empowerment to make relationship agreements based on what you as partners want, not necessarily what the Pope or your family or society pressures you to do. It's an opportunity to negotiate an agreement that you can put your heart into, among other bodily organs, and commit to without resentment or bitterness. It's an opportunity to replace a presumptive agreement that maybe was too restrictive in the first place, that you probably shouldn't have agreed, agreed to if you weren't going to keep it, and to make agreements that you can sincerely commit to because you want to, not because you feel you have to in order to appease someone else or society or God or whatever. Your agreements with your partner, whether it's monogamy or non-monogamy or the ground rules to that or exceptions to that when you give a pass, only have to work for you. They don't have to work for anybody else. It's not their business. Certainly not what you do with your body, despite the current political rage in the United States that is aggressively asserting through changes in regional or even national law that your body, depending on who you are, belongs to the demands of a conservative political party, not you. That's really an affront that's part of our modern social challenges. Healing from the pain of betrayal and anger and hurt and confusion and disorientation of cheating or an affair means agreeing to implement a new normal of understanding how to conduct your relationship. Any choice that the partners make can be viewed as temporary or experimental change, subject to future discussion and reevaluation later, particularly if you decide on some form of consensual non-monogamy. Relationship dynamics and agreements can be fluid throughout your lifetime, or throughout the lifetime of the relationship at least, just as an organization like a hospital or a community organization or a business might imply, uh, implement a continuous quality improvement plan, if you've ever heard of that, a CQI plan, of evaluation, change, re-evaluation, and more change, responding to the current needs of the stakeholders involved, in this case the relationship partners. You change your relationship as needed according to your joint sexual, emotional, and domestic needs over the course of your hopefully long-term relationship and its inevitable developmental changes as you travel through the lifespan, your partner does, and the culture and world changes around you. Darwin said, it was not necessarily the fittest that survive, but those who are the most able to adapt to change over time. Every challenge in a relationship and in life requires our ability to cultivate adaptive coping strategies. That's what clinical social workers like me are always saying when you face a challenge. Okay, what is the adaptive coping strategy for this? And in a relationship, that means to not only endure, but to thrive. So if you need help with your relationship, if you're in California, you're eligible for psychotherapy services because that's where I'm licensed. If you're outside of California or even outside the United States, our work would need to be relationship coaching, which has some overlap, but it's really a separate professional service. It has lots of legal and ethical implications, and I can explain more of that if we talk. So if something like that interests you, or it didn't particularly interest you, but you feel like you need help and you got to do it. Either one is fine. Contact me and the United States at 310-339-5778. That's 310-339-5778. Or you can email me, ken at gaytherapyla.com. And my website, gaytherapyla.com, has lots of information on my services and, of course, a very, very large blog article library that you can search according to whatever interests you, these kinds of topics or other topics of uh, interest to gay men's lives and quality of life. So let me know if you have questions or comments or uh, suggestions for future podcast episodes. I've got a bunch up my sleeve, but could always get your feedback. 
and uh, share this with people, you know, other gay men who you think might benefit from this kind of a resource. Thanks. I'll see you next time.